Leah Kendra Anderson, was born in 1998 in Canada. Due to the father being the victim of a crime in 2003, she and her three siblings had a very difficult childhood, as their mother, after losing her husband, gave into addiction. As a result, social services intervened and placed the four children in foster homes. In total, they went through 13 different foster homes, until, in 2005, their maternal aunt, a woman named Myra Anderson, along with her husband, Wayne Okuma, asked for custody of the children and the state granted them. So after spending over two years in foster homes, Leah finally felt like she had a real home and a family. Later, the family moved to God's Lake Narrows, a small Cree Indian reservation located in the province of Manitoba in Canada. For those who don't know, Cree is an ethnic group native to North America that inhabited from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean, both in the United States of America and in Canada. They are currently considered the largest indigenous group in Canada, with an estimated population of 200,000 members who are spread across the country, whether in conventional cities or Indian reservations. The God's Lake Narrows Reservation is made up about 70 homes and has an estimated population of 200 people today. Because it is a remote place with few residents, everyone knows each other and is seen as a family community. In addition, the reserve is in a very remote area, where the main means of access are by boat or plane. And it was in this community that Leah grew up, being described as a loving, studious girl who always thought about her future. She also had a great appreciation for art, being dancing, singing, music or painting. As a descendant of the Cree people, Leah always participated in indigenous cultural events that were promoted by the community. According to people close to her, the girl loved attending these events as she felt very connected to her Cree heritage. She was even chosen ahead of the community's youth. Still, according to close people, the girl had the dream of one day studying art at the University of Winnipeg, but unfortunately, that dream could not be realized. On January 4, 2013, Leah had arranged with some friends to go ice skating. She had even asked permission to her uncles, and they let her go, but at the last minute, her friends gave up and ended up cancelling. Leah was very frustrated with this, and in order to not to waste a day, she decided to go skating by herself. Around 7.30 pm, Leah left the house, but before leaving, her aunt had told her that she would have to come back before it got too dark, to which the girl would have agreed. A few minutes later, one of Leah's friends knocked on the door looking for her. The girl's aunt said that she had just left. The friend then tried to reach her, but couldn't find her. That night, the hours passed and Leah didn't return home. Immediately, her uncles were not very worried, as they imagined that she had slept at a friend's house. However, the next day, Leah didn't return and also didn't call with news, which led her uncles to be very worried imagined that something bad had happened. They then triggered the authorities and reported their niece's disappearance. Soon, everyone who lived on the reservation got together and started looking for Leah. They searched for hours, but nothing was found, and no one had seen the girl in the last few hours either. On January 6, 2013, at around 10 am, more than 24 hours after Leah Anderson disappeared, police received a call about a body that had been found next to a snowmobile trail on part of the reservation. Upon arriving at the scene, the police could see that the body was severely injured, which made them believe that the victim had been attacked by wolves or some other type of wild animal. Due to the body being unrecognizable due to the severe injuries, as I have already mentioned, it was not possible to make identification at the scene. That same morning, Leah's family heard over the radio that a body had been found, but it had not yet been identified, and that it would only be possible after laboratory analysis. They were afraid, but they still had hope that the body didn't belong to Leah. Later that same day, the body was confirmed to be that of Leah Anderson. This preliminary identification was made by counting the residents, where it was found that the only person missing was her. Later, one of her sisters identified the body through the ice skates that were still with her, and her backpack 
that was found next to the body. On closer examination by forensics on Leia's body, it was revealed that she had not been attacked by a wild animal as initially believed, but rather that she had been attacked by a person, which meant that she had been a victim of a crime. There were defensive wounds on her body, indicating that she had fought off her assailant. DNA evidence was also found as a result of this fight, DNA which was stored by the police. An autopsy report revealed that Leah would have died a few hours after leaving her home, around 10 p.m. Still, according to this report, there were no signs of forced relations. For the authorities, the crime would have occurred in another location and then the criminal abandoned the body in the place where it was found. With the information that there was a criminal on the indigenous reserve, the police became alert, but initially they believed it was an easy case to solve since there were few inhabitants on the reserve. In addition, many hours before Leia left the house, all accesses leading to the Indian reservation were closed due to the snow, so no one would have entered or left during the period in which the crime occurred. This meant that the perpetrator was one of the few hundred people on the reservation. The only way anyone could have managed to leave the boundaries of the Indian reservation was by plane, but there was no record of a takeoff that day. Soon, the theory arose that the criminal could be someone from the reservation itself. This theory gained traction after the police discovered that the snowbill trail on which the body was found was used by liquor smugglers who used it to bring booze into the reserve. In the reservation, the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages is prohibited. But even so, some people from the reservation itself do not respect this rule and smuggle drinks. As the body was found on this trail that was used by these smugglers, the police decided to carry out a toxicological examination on Leia's body to find out if she had consumed any alcoholic beverages, because if she had consumed it, it would probably have some connection with the smuggling. However, after examinations, no alcohol or any other type of narcotics was found in the girl's body. As the investigations progressed, some rumors began to spread to the indigenous community. One of these rumors said that Leia actually went to a party at a friend named Josephine B's house instead of going ice skating like she said to her uncles. The rumors also said that Leah's boyfriend, Max Chubb, had gone looking for her at the Josephine's house, but was not allowed inside as the party was for girls only. Wanted by the police, Josephine said that she really had a party that night, but denied that Leah participated. Another rumor involved a relative of the victim's boyfriend, a boy named Stephen Chubb. In a conversation between Steve and Destiny Anderson, a cousin of Leah, Steve would have said that he had taken someone's life, but refused to say who the person was. He had also sent Leah a Facebook message the morning after she disappeared, asking her not to tell anyone about their brief relationship. The officers took Stephen in for questioning, and questioned him about his relationship with Leah. In his deposition, Stephen admitted to having had a secret relationship with Leah, and that they had broken up a few months ago. Asked about him going around saying that he had taken someone's life, he said it was all just a joke to scare the people around him. After that, Stephen was subjected to two polygraph tests, the famous lie detector, and passed both, being released afterwards. Due to the heavy snowfall on the day of the crime, Leah's family feared that possible evidence had been compromised, as the victim's body, as well as her belongings, were almost covered by snow at the time they were found. But despite this, as I mentioned before, the police managed to find DNA on the body that didn't belong to Leah, and after analysis, they found that DNA belonged to a man. The police then asked all male residents of the indigenous reserve to present themselves to the police department in order to provide genetic material. Many have come forward and given their DNA voluntarily, including Steve Chubb, who at this point was a potential suspect in the case. Everyone on the Indian reservation was convinced that this would reveal who was responsible for the crime. However, for some reason that I have not found any source, the police didn't reveal the results of this analysis to the public, and from that point on, the investigations diminished. Leah's aunt was very frustrated with the officers who were investigating the case. According to her, she could only find out about the progress of the investigations when she went after them 
as they did not communicate anything to her. This frustration is shared by many family members and also by residents of the indigenous reserve who are hoping for a quick outcome to the case. With investigations slowing down as I mentioned, the case ended up being dropped. This angered Leah's family and residents of the reserve. It seemed like such an easy case to solve, but for some reason the police just couldn't solve it. Subsequently, an $11,000 reward was offered to anyone with relevant information regarding the case, but still nothing new emerged. In the year 2015, Leah's sister, a girl named Tiffany, and her aunt, a woman named Josie Stevenson, organized a large walk of several kilometers in order to attract attention to the case. In the same year, a group of about 40 people also held a large walk to call for more attention on cold cases of indigenous women, who were victims of crimes, which included Leah Anderson. In 2017, the police arrested a 23-year-old boy who didn't have his identity released. According to the police, this arrest was a major advance in the investigations. However, this boy was released the very next day. Police officers didn't reveal why he was released, but said he would continue to be investigated because so far he was the main suspect in the crime. Still, according to the police, they decided to keep the identity of this boy confidential, as he could suffer retaliation from other residents of the indigenous reserve. After that, the officers said that investigations were ongoing, but that they couldn't share anything with the public so as not to disturb the solution of the case. However, the years went by and nothing new about the case emerged. For Leah's family, the idea that the criminal still lives among them is agonizing. After the crime, life on the indigenous reserve was never the same. It is said that today, distrust and fear has taken over the place, and many residents have come to see their friends and neighbors with different eyes, and it's likely that this will continue until the day that the case of Leah Kendra Anderson is solved. Well guys, that's it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.